Uh, I'm Sneha Raghavan. I'm a researcher at Asia Archive, and I'm based in New Delhi. Uh, today, uh, the title of my presentation is uh, Towards Modernism, Art of India from 1950 to 1990. Um, as you can see, the from the title itself, the topic is, is really vast. Um, first of all, every aspect of this itself is quite vast. What is modernism is, is a very big question. Uh, art of India, India itself is, is really big. Uh, and the time period itself, we're looking at four decades, 1950 to 1990. So um, within this time period, uh, there have been many movements, many styles, many groups, many, many kinds of practices. So um, what I'm going to do in today's presentation is uh, provide maybe just a few entry points uh, into maybe uh, understanding and looking at what modernism was or is in, in, in India. Um, I don't know if uh, any of you have ever visited India or are familiar with any of the artistic practices uh, in India, but it's, uh, it's, it's a long history, it's a, it's a complex history. So I thought that it would be useful to begin with providing some background uh, to that history. Um, so um, now one of the things about Indian modernist practice is that it's very difficult to pinpoint when it began. So you know, so rather than trying to do that today, I thought that I would begin by generally, you know, giving a brief introduction to the time period of say colonialism onwards. Um, and I'll, I'll explain that um, briefly. But before we even do that, a little, let's take one step back further, just to familiarize all of you with, I mean, what you're seeing here is um, the, the Indian subcontinent or a region that is more often today known as South Asia. Um, which consists, of course, this is a modern, I mean, this is a contemporary sort of map that you're looking at. Um, you're looking, it, it consists of the nations of India, Pakistan, um, Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, um, Afghanistan to some extent. But, but when we are talking of, say, pre-19th pre century, etc., we are, and when we are thinking of, say, pre-colonial India, we are not talking of all these nation states. We are we're talking of just a big geographical region, right? And uh, so I thought that it would also be useful to just show you maybe just one or two slides of what kind of art practices were there before, say, even the 19th century. Now, every uh, different you know, sort of empire, kingdom, community had their own, you know, artistic practices, be it in the form of painting, architecture, sculpture, murals, and so on. So, and it would be very difficult for me to take you through all of those. But just to give you a, a hint of, of something. Um, so this is basically a site called Ajanta, where uh, this is in, in the western region of India where between about the 5th to the 7th century, you have these uh, Buddhist sort of cave paintings that were, that were made over there. And um, there's a reason why I have decided to also show, out of all the forms, I've decided to show you Ajanta. And maybe that will become clear when we look at modernist art practices later. Because a lot of modernist artists decide at some point to go back and look at Ajanta as a source of inspiration. So it, it becomes, uh, in the 20th century, Ajanta and the cave paintings at Ajanta become, they, they are invoked 
as, as a classical, as, as belonging to our classical past, right? So um, similarly, you have um, something as diverse as, and that's why I have just broadly called it miniature painting traditions, because every region across time um, had different kinds of miniature painting traditions. So what you see on, on, on the left is actually uh, a miniature painting from the Mughal um, period. So this is um, a roughly about 15th, 16th century that, that we're talking about. Whereas the, the image on the right is actually coming from what is known as the Pahari miniature painting tradition. So, I mean, just to give you a sense of, of maybe two different styles of, I mean, actually not even two, maybe many more different styles of painting that existed at the time um, before coming down to, um, um, before coming down to the, the colonial period. Now, colonial history in India begins with um, the East India Company is setting up, um, well, their rule in India, so to speak, in 1757. And the colonial period is very crucial because it, it really, um, you know, it, it it brought about a change in understanding about everything, about, about history, about tradition, about the past, about culture, and so on and so forth. So it really also, along with colonialism, came newer sort of forms of knowledge, of ways of understanding. And, and that is why the colonial period in Indian history marks a sort of break from where one, one can see something so that is why when we think of Indian history, we think of it in terms of pre-colonial and you know, the colonial and then the, the post-colonial. So um, maybe before I continue, Erin, would, would you like to sort of, um, after this, yeah? Okay, fine. All right, so, um, so one of the things that happened alongside the East India Company was that you had these um, you had a lot of artists who traveled along with the East India Company and who traveled to different parts of India and who made these paintings and, and artworks documenting, in a sense, you know, the landscapes of India, of the British conquest of India, different forts that they captured. You can see that, you know, this is an Englishman, you know, in fact, an army officer, you know, being, you know, standing there in, in all regal poise in India. So, you know, so this school of painting was known as the company school because of, because the artists traveled along with the East India Company. So that's why they're known as the, the company school of, of painting. And what the company school of painting did uh, was that with their images circulating in India, it, it showcased this very new academic neoclassical style of, you know, um, portraiture and and even just doing I mean even landscape and notions of the picturesque and so on so uh, this the academic art forms that the the company school introduced very heavily influenced a lot of Indian artists um, of the time because this kind of perspective you know this this kind of rendering of of a figure and so on were quite newly introduced and also mediums oil and, and all of these were very new, oil painting, etc. were very new mediums. So in, uh, amongst Indian artists, from about the 1870s onwards, you can see uh, a lot of artists being interested in uh, these new forms of academic art. So basically moving away from the, the traditional practices and sort of coming to try these, these new forms uh, so, for example, this is one of the pioneering artists who, who really began this sort of, um, who, who tried this, this academic art uh, in a sense and made it extremely popular. Raja Ravi Varma is, is an artist whose paintings and whose prints, more importantly, 
uh, were widely circulated. You would find images of, of his works in almost every Indian household at some point. And, and what he did was to try and use this academic style in order to you know, sort of render mythological and religious themes. So these would be, you know, looking at say, uh, really, I mean, folk tales, religious tales, all of these sort of mythological texts, and trying to draw uh, events and you know, kind of uh, things. But apart from that, also portraits of gods and goddesses and so on. And these, in fact, became very widely circulated through his own press. The artist himself had a printing press, which then produced a lot of these these images. Um, Portraiture and, and being painted in this sort of realistic or naturalistic manner was also something that attracted the, the nobility, you know, the so and Ravi Varma was, was a master sort of artist of this kind who was invited to uh, invited by a lot of uh, noble families to make these these portraits. Similarly, another artist of of this time, of this kind, who, who did these kind of works was M. V. Dhurandar. And much like Raja Ravi Varma, what you can see are these, I mean, on, on the left is actually a scene from one of the texts that is known as the Mahabharat. And, you know, so this is a scene of the, of the battleground of, you know, and these are symbolic, all of these, you know, these, these, um, Painting. So they're symbolic of, say, the victory of good over evil, or, you know, I mean, or for that matter, on the right, you find nationalism as a theme that, that begins to be, you know, um, portrayed using this, this academic form. So even though the academic art form was something that was taken from the British, the themes that were being depicted were Indian, right? So that was basically the point that. Um, the academic artists were, were making. So on the right, for example, you see a lot of national leaders, the leaders from, say, national history. And you have in the foreground uh, a sort of uh, anthropomorphic representation of mother India, you know, the nation, the mother of the nation, in a sense, holding the flag. So nationalism as a theme was also extremely central to um, this kind of academic art practice. Before I come to the next uh, sort of movement, very important movement, I thought that I'd just pinpoint on the map for you some cities which are associated with art, in a sense, or production of art. So you have over here Bombay or Mumbai. You have Delhi in, in the north. You have Lahore, which is now in Pakistan. You have Baroda. Calcutta, Shantiniketan. Now, Bombay, Calcutta, and Madras over here were three British presidencies. But um, Delhi was later, again, a capital city. Uh, Lahore was, in fact, the capital of the, a, a region over there on the, known as Punjab. And, well, Baroda and, and Bhopal come up a little later in around uh, 1950s onwards, so I'll come to that. But basically, these are some of the cities that will come up in, in the talk today. So just to show you on a map where, where these places are. Um, if, if academic art that we saw with Raja Ravi Varma, M. V. Dhurandar, if, if they showed national themes um, or mythological and religious themes, um, and and showed depicted those kind of th those kind of topics. There emerged a a movement counter to that, which is known as the the Bengal School because it was in Bengal that you know this this school originated. That is Calcutta, and um, this is also this movement of the Bengal School is also known as revivalism. Um, revivalism because um, the idea was that they, they wanted to revive something, to bring something from the past back to, to life. So um, the, the argument of the, I mean, the, the kind of artwork that the revivalists did 
basically they believed that when we do artwork, um, only the themes and the topics cannot be national, you know. Um, so their position against, say, Raja Ravi Varma was that he was doing Indian themes, but but the material, the style, the the medium, the techniques, everything was actually colonial, was British. So they actually believed that in order to truly be Indian, one had to go back and look at everything from, from one's own past. And one had to revive those art forms of the past, which is why this was called um, revivalism. And one of the pioneering artists who, who undertook this was Abhinindranath Tagore. And this work here is actually a painting of Abhinindranath's brother, Rabindranath Tagore. Um, and this painting, as you can see, is very much in that academic style, which is what Abhinindranath himself was originally trained in. But later, you can see his, his language over here change completely on the left over here. So um, if you saw Mother India in M. V. Dhurandar's, if you remember that depiction of Mother India in this very sort of naturalistic sort of form, you have here, for example, Abhinindranath Tagore's representation of, of Mother India. In, in, and look at the medium, the change in the medium, the change in perspective, everything, the change in technique, all of it has, has completely changed. And the inspiration that they drew for, for much of the work uh, that the revivalists did was actually from Ajanta. And that's why I, I brought up Ajanta, the cave paintings at Ajanta in the beginning. right? So um, there were these artists also believed that instead of looking only at, at the West or at Europe, one must also look at other traditions. So looking at, say, Chinese painting, looking at Japanese painting, all of these things became very important as, as part of the search for becoming Indian modern artists, right? So um, connected to this a little bit, but slightly distinct, was this art institution that was founded by Rabindranath Tagore in, in 1921, which was in this place called Shantiniketan. So, Shantiniketan was, was an art school that was set up by Rabindranath Tagore, a, a university that he set up actually in 1921 to, to, to provide alternative sort of models of education. Because until then, in India, the universities were all the British universities and the, you know, the government colleges that were set up by the British. So Shantiniketan was imagined as an alternative model for, for not just art education, but generally for, for university education. And uh, it, was Im it was, in fact, the place that Shantiniketan was located in was, was very remote. You know, it was away from the city, almost cut off from, from everything. One had to travel there for four hours, so it was isolated. And it was almost like a monastery, you know. So it was called the Shantiniketan Ashram. And the ashram is actually a, a, a monastery, a place for, for meditation to kind of to, to slowly think about what one is studying and learning and, and so on. So the art school at Shantiniketan was, was absolutely um, central in, say, uh, in the modern art movement. But unlike the revivalists who said that everything had to be say, Indian and national, and it had to come from the national past, uh, Rabindranath Tagore believed in something that is known as pan-Asianism, to, to make solidarities and connections with artists and writers and thinkers all over Asia. So one of the uh, important figures for Rabindranath Tagore was Okakura Tenshin from Japan who Rabindranath met, they corresponded, and, and they, the idea was not about a, a sort of, it was not so much to, um, uh, the interest was not in building or, or coming up with a national style, you know, but more of, of an international 
you know, brotherhood, a universal brotherhood that artists all over the world belong to uh, an international sort of brotherhood. In Shantini Ketan, there was also a continued and a sustained interaction with artists from all over Asia. You have people from Indonesia, from Burma, from Japan, from China, visiting Shantini Ketan. Uh, artists from Shantini Ketan also traveled very often to many of these countries. And this, for example, is Yokoyama Taikan. And the kind of paintings that they made greatly influenced the, the style of paintings that emerged from Shantini Ketan. The wash technique, for example, became very distinctive practice of Shantini Ketan. Uh, it was also much more freer and much more fluid because uh, Rabindranath Tagore did not believe in just practicing one style, but encouraged people to come up with as many styles as possible. So artists experimented also with cubism, with, with impressionism, with, with so many other forms as well, apart from um, anything else that they were looking at. So just to give you an idea, you will not find a very, dis you know, you won't find a single style of, of art practice coming out of Shantini Ketan, but each artist really was uh, developed their own styles. So Nandalal Bose, for example, was, was an important teacher at Shantini Ketan, but more importantly, was, uh, was trained under Abhanindranath Tagore. So even though he was in Shantini Ketan, his art forms, he believed in looking back at Ajanta, looking back at other sort of uh, art forms from India's past as a source of inspiration. Whereas you would find someone like Binod Bihari Mukherjee who was much more interested in Chinese painting, in, in Japanese painting and those, um, and also in miniature traditions. So you can see influences of those in, in, in his works, in the way that he has composed these murals. Um, or someone absolutely different, like Ramkin Karbej, and who as a sculptor is generally recognized as one of the first modern Indian sculptors for his use of a material like concrete. Because until that time, um, concrete as, as a material for sculpture was not really um, used, at least not in this scale. So, um, this was, so, so far we have seen the academic art of Raja Ravi Varma. We have seen revivalism and, and the Bengal school. We have seen Shantini Ketan. And um, what we will see now is um, that while artists were, of course, looking at um, Western art, we've seen artists looking at Chinese art and so on. So this, for example, is an artist a uh, very important artist who is looking, you can see that in his initial time period, 1910, he was looking at, say, Renaissance, early Renaissance artwork, and trying to render it in, in, his, own, in his own way over here. But apart from looking at classical forms, um, artists were also looking at, um, say, folk art forms that were existing in, in, in India. So these folk art forms are not art forms of the past, but art forms that are happening, that were happening in um, the early 20th century to develop their own forms of, of classical sort of modern works. So if you, if you see here in this slide on the right, you have these Kaligat Bazaar paintings. So these are basically paintings that were made in the, in the street and sold, I mean, you know, these are very popular kind of folk painting traditions, which a modern artist then developed and, and you know, sort of refined. So you can see how the eyes and the outlines become much more stylized over here in, in this kind of practice. Um, the other artist that I, I think here I would like to mention is um, a very significant, a landmark figure for modern Indian art. Uh, her name is Amrita Shergil, and uh, born in Hungary, trained to, in, in Paris. Amrita's early work was, was heavily influenced by post-impressionism, as, as you can see. And, but at a certain point in the 1930s, um, she decided to return to, to India and, and decided to travel all over India because she believed that somewhere she needed to 
find her roots. And, and this quest, once again, uh, takes her back to all of these important places, you know, Ajanta, looking at m miniature painting, traveling to Rajasthan, and looking at various painting traditions there. And you can see how the language has completely, you know, sort of shifted from that, that first slide of looking at, I mean, of, of doing imp post-impressionist artwork to evolving a language that is, again, uh, it, it, you can see that there are relations to the Ajanta paintings over here. But it's also a, a, a careful sort of deliberation. There is, you know, a, a, a stylization that's that's happening over here, and this return to to the classical past, you know, of what is you know classical art forms is something you will you will see you will keep seeing at every stage, uh, in in the history of modernist art practice. In in 1947, India attained. Um, political independence from, from the British. And, and what you can see here are actually those, um, those two maps. I mean, um, you can see very clearly in these two maps the difference between what was British India and, and uh, a, a picture of the, the different nation states that came out of um, this, this 19, I mean, this time period of 1947. So along with attaining um, uh, I mean, along with independence, there also occurred a very important um, sort of political event, which was, uh, which we know as the partition. Um, so the partition is basically the partition of, of India, Pakistan, and later in 1971, Bangladesh. So um, the partition of these nation states um, was, was, a was a deeply traumatic sort of historical event. And uh, many, uh, I mean, it has, it has continued to traumatize um, many communities even today uh, because it involved a lot of resettling migration movement. And, and um, so, uh, in, and in fact, the first sort of artist so um, group that I will be talking about in this situation of a post-independent um, sort of Indian context is actually of these artist associations or artist groups that were formed all over India in the 1940s, known as the Progressive Artists Association, and and these were Progressive Artists Associations were formed in different parts of India. So you had them in Calcutta, in in Bombay, in in Madras, and so on. And I'm going to speak in particular about the Bombay Progressive Artists Group, and and that they believed in that that you know uh, that the trauma of partition and that there was too much of, of nationalism in a sense that that kind of sentiment was overbearing it had it it led to great political catastrophes and therefore they believed that one had to sort of create new standards for living and that art could be one of those sort of vehicles you know that would set these new standards and um, Therefore, the, the progressive artist group really desired to break away from the Bengal school and the revivalist nationalism and participate in, in an international sort of community of, of artists. So the, the idea was that one, one should be able to paint with absolute freedom. One, one should be able to to paint in or, or to make artwork in any form, any style that one was interested in doing. And it is because of this that for, to some extent, um, that some art historians and art critics associate the progressive artist group as being the properly modern artists in, in that sense. Many art historians believe that, that modern art or the beginning of modern art can be attributed to the progressive artist group. Um, so uh, you can see from the images that I'm showing of some artists who belong to this school that they, they worked with absolutely different concerns, different styles. Um, this is the work of Souza, who, who is somebody who explored in his work, apart from many things, a lot of Christian thematic. Um, his work was also very expressionistic as opposed to somebody who we 
um, you probably have heard of, M.F. Hussein, um, who worked, again, in, in a somewhat um, modified cubist style, if it could be called that. But um, you, I, I don't know if this, this artwork reminds you of something, because um, that was basically um, Hussein's sort of um, sort of take on the on Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper. So you can see here that there is a um, a headless person at the at seated at the head of the table, uh, a blind man delivering justice um, next next to that figure. And so all of these were many of these works were created in response to many political and social upheavals in, in the country. Um, and uh, you can also see here another work um, by M.F. Hussein, which, um, again, as you can see, is in fact, you know, um, the composition is, speaks very closely to uh, the Pieta of, of Michelangelo. So, um, Another important artist and another um, stylistic sort of development that happened around this time was actually a movement towards abstraction. So from, the, from about the 1940s, 1950s, and so on, you have artists who were part of the progressive artist group, but also outside, who began to really explore abstraction as, as, as a sort of um, um, important sort of movement away from from figuration. 